The first church in Antipolo was built by the Society of Jesus under Fray Juan de Salazar in preparation for the arrival of the image of Nuestra Señora de la Paz y Buen Viaje in 1632. The church suffered severe damage several times, yet it became a popular pilgrimage site for devotees. On June 18, 1925, Pope Pius XI granted the Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage, also known as the Virgin of Antipolo, a pontifical coronation. The rite of coronation was executed on November 28, 1926 by then Archbishop of Manila, Archbishop Michael James O'Doherty. The church was elevated to the status of cathedral on June 25, 1983, and declared a national shrine in January 1954. A papal decree from Pope Francis elevated the cathedral to an international shrine, and this took effect on March 25, 2023. The decree makes it the first international shrine in the Philippines. It is also the first Marian international shrine in Asia. On January 26, 2024, with over 80 bishops in attendance, Apostolic Nuncio to the Philippines, Archbishop Charles John Brown, presided over the rite of solemn declaration of the Antipolo Cathedral as the international shrine of Our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage. Let us now listen to the reflection of His Excellency, Archbishop Charles John Brown, on the first word, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The first word of Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are pilgrims of hope in this year of prayer. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has designated this year, 2024, as a year of prayer in anticipation of the Jubilee year, which will begin at Christmas time of this year and pass into 2025. And there's no better way for us to enter into this year of prayer than by meditating on the seven words of Jesus from the cross. The first word, as you've heard me already pronounce, is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Think about the scene. Jesus has been judged by Pilate. He has been scourged. He has carried his cross through the streets of Jerusalem. He approaches the hill of Golgotha, and there he is crucified. His hands, which had healed so many people throughout Judea and Galilee, are nailed to the cross. His feet are fastened also with nails to the cross, and the cross is raised. And Jesus, who was relatively silent during his trial, not completely silent, but relatively silent, now begins to speak from the cross to speak to that small gathering of disciples at the foot of the cross, his blessed mother, Our Lady, Mary, Mary Magdalene, St. John the Apostle, that very small group that remained faithful to Jesus at the foot of the cross. And we, as we follow these seven last words of Jesus, are like that small group, listening to him speaking now from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His prayer is directed, first of all, to the Father. That's how this prayer begins, this first word, Father. What a beautiful word. Jesus is the image of the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. He is the one who reveals to us the love of the Father. Jesus now is in communion with the Father in this moment of agony from the cross, and he directs his heart, his mind, to his heavenly Father. And what does he say? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Last night, we participated in the Mass of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the moment in which he gave us the gift of the Eucharist, his body and his blood, under the form, the appearance of bread and wine. And at the Last Supper, Jesus washed the feet of the apostles. And as he was doing that, if you listened carefully last night, you heard Jesus say to the apostles at that moment as he washed their feet, what I am doing, you do not understand now. Later you will understand. 
what I'm doing now, you don't understand, as he washed their feet, but later you will understand. Why is he saying that? Because obviously it was an act of humility, an act of reconciliation. It was an act, a gesture that seemed to be very evident, very expressive of what it intended to communicate. Then why does Jesus say, what I'm doing now you don't understand? It seems it's very understandable what he was doing when he washed the feet of the disciples, of the apostles. But what did they not understand? What they did not understand was that one of the apostles had betrayed him. At the Last Supper, the other 11 did not know that. They only found out later, last night, when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then they understood that Judas had betrayed him. And Jesus, knowing that, still washed the feet of Judas. Judas. Jesus reaches out to Judas in an act of reconciliation, an act of humility in front of Judas, his betrayer, washing his feet, embracing him, trying to retain him, keep him with him, with Jesus, even though Judas had in his heart already decided to betray the Lord. So we have this scene of Jesus going to an extreme of love in the Last Supper. And that same dynamic is repeated from the cross in this first word, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus is dying on the cross and he is asking forgiveness for those who are putting him to death. He's asking forgiveness for his torturers, for his tormentors. And he even gives an excuse for them. They do not know what they're doing, Father. You know, when we love someone, we make excuses for them. We excuse their faults, right? When we don't love, one, love someone, we accuse them. We have that dichotomy between excusing and accusing. In Latin, between excusatio and accusatio. Excusing, accusing. Jesus on the cross is the one who excuses. He makes an excuse for the ones who are torturing him. The opposite is what the devil does. The devil is not an excuser, but the devil is an accuser. In the final book of the Bible, the book of the apocalypse of Revelation, the evil one is revealed as the accuser. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 now have salvation and power come, the reign of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers is cast out, who night and day accused them before God. They defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Love for life did not, did not deter them from death. This is a scene at the end of time, the heavenly Jerusalem. The accuser is cast out. He is cast out by the blood of the Lamb. And that is what is happening on the cross at this moment in these words of Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus is excusing, and he's casting out, casting away the accuser, the one who accuses, the one who finds fault, the one who points fingers at people. That is what the devil does. He is, in Latin, the accusator, fratrum nostrorum, the accuser of, our brother, accuser of our brothers. Jesus, in love with humanity, excuses. The devil, in hatred, accuses. And for us, brothers and sisters, we know what side we need to be on as Christians. We need to follow the example of our Lord. We are called to forgive, to defeat the devil by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb of God on the cross flowing down from his wounds at this moment as we contemplate him, imitating his forgiveness and not imitating the accusing attitude of the devil. Forgiveness is never easy. And there are degrees of forgiveness, different types of forgiveness. But real forgiveness means that we stop basing our actions, our thoughts, our feelings on what someone else has done to us the hurt that we've received. We don't act on it. We don't think about it. We don't base our thoughts about the other person based on how we have been treated badly. That's what real forgiveness is. It means to kind of, with regard to another person, act and believe and feel as if nothing had happened, as if nothing had happened, as if 
the offense is erased. That's what true forgiveness is. That's what excusing is. That's what complete forgiveness is. And as I said, it's never easy to forgive, to imitate Jesus on the cross, the blood of the lamb, to defeat the accuser with the blood of the lamb. To do that, we need to pray. We need to be men and women of prayer. If we pray, we'll have the grace to forgive those who have hurt us. And we need to intercede for those who have hurt us. We need to pray like Jesus did, for them, by name. When you find in your heart that someone has offended you or hurt you, pray for that person by name. Ask God to bless that person. That's the best way in which that beautiful forgiveness can begin to grow in our heart. And we can be imitators of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who excuses, not accuses. Christians do that. The first martyr, the proto-martyr, St. Stephen, in the Acts of the Apostles, this amazing recounting of the martyrdom of Stephen, which involves Paul, then called Saul, who is there present at the martyrdom of Stephen. Stephen, who is being stoned to death in the Acts of the Apostles, He imitates the Lord in what we've just heard. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What does he say? While they were stoning him, the Acts of the Apostles says, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then the author of the Acts of the Apostles tells us, when he said this, he fell asleep in death. And then the uh, the Acts of the Apostles says, Saul approved of their killing. Later on, Saul will become Paul. Saul will be converted. By the prayer of Stephen, by the forgiveness of Stephen, something was beginning to change in Saul's heart and was leading him on the road to Damascus in which Saul would become Paul. By the example, but not just the example of Stephen, by the prayer of Stephen, which is the prayer of Jesus from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness leads to conversion, to the conversion of sinners. And even in Christian tradition of the cross, we have that beautiful tradition of Saint Longinus, the Roman centurion who tradition tells us was the Roman soldier who thrust the lance into the side, into the heart of Jesus, from which comes blood and water. The tradition is that that Roman soldier was converted The full tradition is that he was beginning to go blind. He said he had eye problems. And as he pushed the lance into the heart of Jesus, some of the blood and water flowed out and hit the eyes of Longinus. And he was able to see physically. But that seeing, really physical seeing, is a manifestation of the interior seeing. That Longinus, the Roman soldier, who heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, and the them is him for they know not what they are doing, is converted by the cross of Jesus. And the Catholic tradition is, Longinus himself goes on to be a martyr. So these words are so filled with meaning, with tradition, with significance for us as Catholics. The cross is our life, because the cross is the place in which Jesus adores the Father in the most perfect way, and shows us what it means to be one who adores the Father in spirit and in truth by forgiving, by imitating the Lord. The cross is our life. Let us stand with Mary, our Blessed Mother, with Mary Magdalene, with St. John the Apostle, the beloved disciple at the foot of the cross, and contemplate these words of the Lord directed to our hearts. Ave crux spes unica, hail the cross, our only hope. Father, we thank you for the example of forgiveness shown by Christ and for the reminder that forgiveness is an act of humility and reconciliation that leads to the conversion of sinners. We pray for those who still carry hatred and accusations in their heart, that we may be directed to imitate the Lord in forgiveness, even as we bear our crosses, that like Christ, we may adore the Father in the most perfect way and find it in our hearts to forgive especially those who know not what they do. Oh
Hey, who?